but I wanted to ask some of our panelists a few follow-on questions to, to look at the, uh, sort of explore some of the things that Dan has said in more detail. And then we'll open the floor to, to you for your questions and comments, because I'm sure you have some. Um, I, I wanted to, to start with Nick over on my right here. And I was wondering, Nick, if, if you could talk a little bit about how you think host governments affect response analysis and how agencies can build better relationships with them to improve this. Okay. Thank you very much, Wendy. Um, and, and thank you to Dan. I just wanted to uh, compliment you on a, on a great piece of research. I think that's a, a, a kind of a wonderful um, explanation of, of where we currently stand in terms of uh, the process of programming humanitarian food aid and nutrition responses. Um, maybe just a kind of a, a general comment before answering your, your specific mm. question, because I mean, like, like Dan, I've sort of been struggling with this for, for many years, and I think you know, Simon and Claire's paper was obviously a starting point. Also, James Darcy's work on, uh, mm -hmm. on According to Need, I think, really kind of triggered our, our thinking on this. And maybe just to, to reiterate what Dan was saying, I, th I think you know, we really started at coming at this from two perspectives. One was looking at better situational analysis, a better understanding of you know, who, where, how bad is it, and all the work that I think um, Devereaux started with Paul Howe and leading on to the IPC work that Nick Hahn did, and we had considerable success on that part of the equation. And then obviously in parallel with that, much more thought about what we do, what are the range of responses we can do. And then it was later on, we figured out the two pieces of this equation weren't quite matching up. There was a gap between it. Um, and so we've had this whole investment in, in the process of, of response analysis. And, and I think this has been hugely problematic, actually. I, I personally feel that we haven't, unlike the other areas where we have made more progress, we haven't made the sort of level of, of progress we'd have, we'd have liked to. And maybe the lesson from experience is that just how complex this task is and what the range is, I think Dan's paper showed very clearly, what the range of influences is, the, the diverse influences, the diverse questions that we, we have to answer there, all of which have kind of erected a number of, of roadblocks in, in terms of our ability to, uh, to link these, these, these two parts of the question. And uh, I, mean, I guess the point I'm trying to make is I think where we saw it initially going was a very linear process, situation analysis, response analysis, um, better programming. And I think that just doesn't work. You know, that's, that's the, to me, that's the takeaway message. Um, elements that it work, but as Dan was saying, it's very much how we better use information across the whole programming cycle at different stages to better inform the planning of our responses. Um, and so just, I think it's, uh, I struggle a little bit with this term response analysis, because it, it still seems to apply a kind of unitary process. Um, so I, th I prefer to look at it as a much broader question of, of better response planning and, and how we contribute to that. Um, so that said, I, th I think your specific question was how do host governments affect response analysis? Um, well, again, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to take issue there, and I think that's the wrong question. Um, I think that our ambition has got to be much broader in, in how we approach the delivery, uh, the delivery of, of humanitarian food assistance and, and nutrition support. And if we're going to really um, deliver, it has to be done at scale. Um, it has to be done through, wherever possible, rights-based approaches. And here it's a question of governments taking the lead. So I don't think it's, it's governments affecting the response analysis that's done by agencies. I would like to reverse it and say we need to think about how response analysis contributes to better programming decisions by government, wherever possible. And there are certain situations where that isn't possible, and of course you're looking at you know, the roles of the big UN agencies, for example. Um, and if we're going to do that, I, I think <laughs> there are some, some sort of simple messages there. Um, governments are big bureaucracies. They, they don't operate in, in flexible and adept ways. They need simple messages. And I do get a little bit concerned sometimes when I look at the range of tools and the depth of analysis that we're outrunning the absorptive capacity of decision makers. So I think we need to strip this back and get much more simple rather than getting more complex and, and deeper understandings which, which simply don't translate into 
decision make better decisions. And I'd maybe also take issue with the idea of um, default responses. I think there's a lot of criticism of default responses, uh, particularly I think the kind of reliance on food aids and seeds and tools kind of gave a bad name to them. But actually, if if they're based on evidence and they're good responses, I don't have such an issue with it. Um, I think that's the way agencies work. They build up competencies and capacities. And as long as those um, responses are well thought out, I, I think that's the way people operate. So I will put the emphasis back on learning about what works, evidence about good responses, rather than a, a kind of a, an analysis in each individual context of trying to tailor a response to, to that, um, that situation. So I think that's kind of how we should maybe structure our engagement with, with, with governments. Hmm. Do you think that uh, what Dan and the, and the other researchers have done in this paper, which is to sort of make explicit what people actually do as opposed to what we say that we do, is, is that useful? Because it, it's more an issue of saying, well, we do use these default responses and why do we use them? You know, recognizing that we do do it. Because I think often we say that we do go through this analytical process and this is how we arrived at, at this uh, response. But in reality, it's a default response, which could be good or might not be, but we're not being very honest sometimes about how we arrive at it. Do you think that's one of the issues that... Uh, that Dan's highlighting. Absolutely, yeah. And I think there's, there's a learning cycle which, mm. needs, which needs to be encouraged there be, between responses. And I think that can lead to a, a process of refinement and, in, and improvement over time. Mm. Mm. Did you, Duncan, did you want to I think add to that? The learning issue is a key point, which I think we, um, DFID is looking at. We have a new um, research strategy looking at evidence in evidence and innovation and humanitarian response to try and join that circle that isn't necessarily working, that what's learned in one response is fed into future responses. Mm -hmm. But also on the, the government, um, host, host government, you can call it, I think it poses a bigger challenge to, particularly in protracted crises, less so in sudden onset, but in protracted crises where we have a humanitarian response that's trying to tackle longer term chronic issues, whether that's nutrition or food security, and we do need to think about new ways of operating in those contexts, working through the government, which I know can pose a challenge to humanitarians on humanitarian principles of impartiality and neutrality, but in we have to try and work out a way to bring together those the sort of two worlds of principles because we're talking about, particularly in food security, which is a long-term challenge, we're talking about long-term issues which need to be addressed and ultimately working through host governments, local civil society and individuals themselves, that's the way to solve the problem, not necessarily with what we would label as humanitarian responses. And I guess this is a question for everyone, but what about the recipients? Dan mentioned that um, nobody, well, very few people say less than 25%, I think you said, Dan? <laughs> I was trying to be careful about how closely, <laughs> uh, how specifically <laughs> I quantified that, but I, I would say about a quarter mentioned that. Yeah, um, said that they'd actually consulted people and asked them, you know, what they wanted or what they thought was was appropriate for their mm -hmm. situation. This is interesting, and it resonates, I think, with some other recent work that's been done, not in relation to food security specifically, but the new Time to Listen report mm -hmm. that was put out by the CDA. Um, they interviewed six thousand aid uh, recipients or beneficiaries. And the majority of those people indicated that, you know, aid agencies, including humanitarian agencies, don't talk to them, don't listen to them, don't ask them. Mm -hmm. So wha where do you think the, the recipients fit into this equation? We've talked about government, host governments, donor governments, aid agencies. Simon? <coughs> Should we have something to say mm -hmm. about that? Um. Uh, a couple of things. The, the first thing would be, um, if you're asking the recipients what they would prefer, then I think you're starting with the wrong question. So, well, not getting any of the questions. Right well, exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't your question, but the agency. So, so, so not only are agencies not asking the question, but the question they're not asking is the wrong question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you see what I mean. Um, <laughs> no, it doesn't make sense. I think it might not tomorrow, but it doesn't now. Um, And, and I think, and, and, th and the reason is kind of related to, to a little bit of the bigger picture about response analysis. Response analysis is always around what should I do? 
And that's also the wrong question to start with, because the right question to start with should be what needs to happen. Mm. And when you work out what needs to happen, you then work out what your role is within that, if indeed you have a role, which very often, if you're in a crisis, you, you, you should be having a role. Uh, we don't do that. We start with the project. I mean, I have a real problem. This will take me even back even further. I mean, I've, I'm currently sort of on a one-person worldwide campaign to, to, to ban the use of, of the phrase needs assessment because that's also not really where we should... That's fine for... That is fine for a very kind of sudden onset first week. Kind of what the hell do people need to stay alive? But we know that that's not what humanitarian response is about. I mean, I can't remember the figures off the top of my head, but broadly speaking, over the last 10 years, the top 10 recipients of humanitarian aid have not changed. And if they have, then at least 9 out of 10 have always been the same. What, Afghanistan, Sudan, DRC, Palestine... Well, who have I missed out? Anyway, we <laughs> fill, fill, fill in the rest. So we're not dealing with kind of the first week of a crisis, what do you need? Because, you know, and then absolutely, what do you need? Beyond that, it's about what's going on? What's the problem? Um, the, 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 mo the most frightening slide I saw, Dan, can you just put out the one with the four lovely, c the, the, the really nice colour shaded one? It was a really nice one, that one. Yeah? The that's the one, that's the one there. Mm. Now, if you're actually looking at, if, you, if you're actually looking at, well, what's the problem? Yeah? I suppose, what, so fine, immediate, sudden onset, what do you need? Fine, let's put that aside because that's 0.1% of what we do, probably. Um, what's the problem? I would call that kind of problem analysis, which is here, contextual factors. Yeah, on that, that's the one that most closely uh, goes in there. And I have kind of from here, while that slide was up, I was kind of trying to do a, a rough mathematical calculation of the percentage of the total area of those things <laughs> that that covers, it's a, somewhere between 1% and 2%. So about 1% or 2% of the influence um, of decision-making is about, well, what's the problem? Um, and of that, it's kind of 50% between assumption and evidence, so cut it in half, so we're somewhere between half a percent and 1% is based upon evidence of what's happening. Now, why is that in some way related to the question that Wendy tried to ask me about, about, <laughs> about recipients? <laughs> The first question is not kind of, well, okay, yeah, what do recipients need, we said, for the sudden? Beyond that is, what are recipients trying to do? Yeah? What is their role within all of this? And that kind of leads back in a bit of a circle to the whole idea of, you know, the project and what do I do? Um, it's not about what I do on my project, you know, which is kind of you know, this small set of people. It's about what's going on out there? What are people trying to do for themselves? Not how do they fit into my world? You know, would you prefer cash or would you prefer food? Fine, you know, better, maybe better to ask than not ask, but there are problems even with that, as, I'm sure, as, as Sarah can, can, can bring in later. Um, but it's more about, well, you know, kind of what are you trying to do? What, what are your objectives? What are your current strategies? What's blocking your current strategies? And it seems to me that that dialogue is not really about the recipient pre preferences, but if it, it, it's more in, if you like, the situation analysis. And that's what, what, I, that's what should determine our response. Um, and we don't do it. I mean, I mean, some other work actually I was doing with Sarah, which I wasn't thinking of. Um, we were looking at a response in Haiti, and, and the only phrase that we could come up with to capture what the agencies were, do, were doing uh, was avoiding reality. It was like, let me just kind of worry about my project and what I can control and kind of get the, get the data to justify that and the money. But actually, the bigger picture stuff around the solutions people are trying to find and how I could support that didn't really figure at all, and that's reality. Um, and that's the stuff that, 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 that we don't do very well. Did I answer your question? No, I think, I think you answered a much better question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but Simon, I, I wanted to, um, I wanted you to carry on a little bit longer. Oh. How nice. I know, it's, it's a rare, rare, uh, rare time. No one ever listens to me, you see. No, no, no one ever listens when I talk. It's nice to have an audience. But I mean, looking back, uh, <laughs> Dan mentioned your uh, network paper that you wrote actually for HPN some years ago, Missing the Point. And uh, I mean, the, this network paper again notes that there's little integration between nutrition and food security sectors. I mean, why do you think that so little progress has been made? Is it for the reasons you've just been talking about? Um, don't think so. Um, They have, I mean, th th it's one of the conundrums because there are basically only really sort of two conceptual frameworks that have ever actually used, it seems, that, that I've come across, that have ever actually used in, in sort of, you know, the response analysis and the situation analysis and so on. Um, and one is, a, a one is around food security, 
a sustainable livelihood framework, things like that. And the other is around malnutrition, and uh, which is the you know the, the UNICEF causal. Everyone knows it. And those do kind of do get used, and pretty much nothing else around really kind of gets used all the time in practice. And the, and and the kind of the, the odd thing about the sort of food security and nutritional is that both. Both frameworks will see the other as being a part of it. So, you know, the, the, the food security sees nutrition as being a part of food security, and nutrition sees food security as being part of nutrition. So, you, you know, you'd think it would be possible for the, for the two worlds to come together, and they don't. Um, so, the so, to, so to me, the reason can't, it, it, it's not technical um, why they don't come together. Um, I think nutrition works at the level of the individual. Um, and I think that's the reason, for example, why there's probably been huge progress in, um, in, in emergency nutritional responses, because there's evidence out there, um, and you can get evidence. You, know, you, you, you weigh the kids now, you weigh them in a month's time, you do different stuff, you, weigh, you know, keep on weighing, and, and, and you work out what, what's worked. And there's been a huge revolution in nutritional responses in the, in the last decade or so. Um, there's also been an awful lot of continuing the same lack of evidence-based stuff going on, but, but let's put that to one side. Um, when it comes to the food security side, there's almost no evidence out there on what works. Um, a while ago, I was asked to design so, so, some, some study and to look where, where we could get evidence to find out which kind of livelihoods programming has, um, has an impact for um, people suffering from displacement. And I kind of put out a call to, to anyone I know or doing any research anywhere on, can anyone give me any paper showing any kind of Never mind a formal impact assessment and the control trials, put that to one side, but any paper that looked at, 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 at impact of any different livelihood and tried to say, this works for these people in this context, and I am still waiting to get one single paper. <laughs> <laughs> and if any of you have it, my email address, you'll find your <laughs> Seriously, I would love to see it. Yeah, it's not out there. Um, so I think that's another of the reasons, is that, is, is, is that people just focus on different things. They, they, th there are bureaucratic silos which keep them apart. Um, we don't know how to integrate um, um, each other's approaches, but I think far more it's, it's around this kind of the, 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 the unit of analysis is, 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 is one, some people are very, very successful because their problem is at the level of the, of, of the individual and they can control stuff, which is great. And that's exactly what, you know, you don't want doctors who look at broader context, you want a doctor who looks at you. Whereas food security isn't like that. And we don't quite know how to put the two together. Um, and I don't think it's technical. Um, I, think, I, 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 I think it's more this bigger picture stuff it's looking at the reality. Um, that's enough. Thanks, Simon. <laughs> um, Duncan, did you did you have a comment to make on that? I think one of the links between food security and nutrition, the challenge is that, and it's linked to the response or situation analysis. I think you've correctly called it because, <coughs> excuse me, we need to situate the humanitarian response in the wider development context of what's happening, and. Um, by the time you get to the stage that a nutrition response is needed, whether that be supplementary feeding or therapeutic feeding, you've already narrowed down your options quite dramatically. Mm. You've got, when if you're responding late, you've already sort of 80% of the options are ruled out because you're at a stage where you're having to go from A to B. We are giving a child uh, therapeutic feeding and the child um, then su hopefully survives. And if you can respond earlier, which DFID is looking at, you would then give the opportunity to diversify your options because you'd have other areas to look at. Specifically on the agriculture and nutrition link, I know DFID is looking at some research in that area. We did a systematic review last year looking at it. And also in the economics of early response and resilience work that we did last year, which um, you may have fact seen on our website, we're looking at a second phase to try and do a bit more on the agriculture nutrition realm because being an agriculturalist, Logically, it seems that it should have an impact, but I would agree with Simon that we don't have the evidence to prove that long-term investment in agriculture necessarily has a positive impact on nutrition. Intuitively, it should do, but the evidence is not as strong as we would like it to be. Okay. Nick, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, or otherwise well I was going to ask you, or I will ask you as well, <laughs> about just... Um, if you could talk a little bit about your experience uh, with ECHO, because you had several years uh, you know, leading the team in Nairobi and mm. obviously dealing with uh, responses in, in the region and with NGOs, host government, you know, regional issues. I just wondered if you could maybe highlight what you felt were some of the, the issues 
from Dan's paper that resonate with your experience there? Yeah, sure. I mean, okay, a couple of points. I mean, I think um, feeding off of some of the things Simon said as well um, mm. related to this. I mean, I think this, this question of evidence is key. <laughs> Um, I mean, I don't think we can begin to start to talk about response analysis unless we've got some basis for knowing about whether the responses we're advocating work in general, let alone in a, in a specific context. And if I reflect on what has changed over the last few years in terms of programming practice, and there have been some pretty big shifts, I think it's around the topics where there has been a solid evidence base. I mean, things like cash-based programming, uh, things like CMAM in the, in the nutrition world, and I, I almost feel like those um, innovations have taken hold without the need for something we call response analysis. You know, if, if the evidence is out there, <laughs> I think you, you reach a certain point of momentum where people can't deny it and it, and it forces an organizational change and it, and it overcomes a lot of these kind of institutional barriers which, which tend to kind of mitigate against um, uptake of, of these good ideas. So, so that to me would be one of the key areas that I would like to see strengthened. I think you know, good old-fashioned um, evidence of, about impact. Um, in terms of kind of other things which which maybe work, I think that's a, the kind mm -hmm. of the, the gist mm -hmm. of your your, your question. Um, I think one of the things is is doing things collectively, and I think this resonates with <laughs> with the point that that Simon was making as well. I think far too we. We need to step outside of traditional structures and ways of doing things. I, I don't think it's good enough to kind of think in old-fashioned ways about this is my agency, this is my project, how do I do response analysis? Um, I think there needs to be a much bigger systems type, type approach to the planning of, of responses. Um, and the first question has to be, as you said, what should we do collectively as a, as a humanitarian community, as a, as a development community often as well? Um, and only once you've answered that part of the question should you then go into the feasibility question about what can my agency do to contribute to that response. Otherwise, we're inevitably going to get the wrong answer. You're going to be, you're, well, maybe get the wrong answer. You're going to be led by what you can put on the table, not what you should do. And maybe in some situations you don't have anything to offer. That might be the question. Simon, you're looking at me. But yes, you, I, I did want to say one thing, which is actually... My first question wasn't what should we do, although I, I, that's, that that'll be my second no. question. Just to, just to interject slightly, sorry. My first question was what should happen, which isn't quite the same as what should we do. So what should happen starts with what are people doing for themselves and so what kind of changes need to see. Then the second question is, which I, which, which, which I missed out actually, is what should we collectively do? And then the third question is, is, is what should I do? Sorry to um, put that one in. I Thanks. think it's significant. Thanks. No, that's an interesting yeah. clarification. Now, Duncan, um, you're a resilience advisor, and resilience, of course, is a very hot topic these days. <laughs> and I wondered if you could tell us, I'm not going to tell Simon <laughs> this <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell Duncan. <laughs> I'll talk to Simon about it later. Yes. <laughs> Simon will talk to you about it later. Yeah. Yes, I wanted to know if you could, uh, could tell us how you feel that the issues raised in the network paper relate to the issue of disaster resilience. Um, Disaster resilience is what the conflict humanitarian security team of uh, DFIDY SIT is focusing on. And one of the key issues that has come out in the discussions around sort of humanitarian at that end of that spectrum is very much how we can improve the quality of what we do. There are lots of examples of humanitarian response <coughs> doing a great job of saving lives in the immediate aftermath of a crisis, but then further on down the line we've discovered some not horrible impacts, but some negative impacts. The tsunami response in uh, Indonesia and Sri Lanka is one of them, where yes, a great job was done saving lives, but potential negative impacts on the environment afterwards have posed a challenge after the, after the events, sort of after the recovery pe period. So I think for us, the crucial thing is, and my background is in development, not in humanitarian, is we're trying to build the links between the two, that we really, humanitarian response needs to see itself sitting in the broader picture of what's happening in a development context. So I would tend to agree on the sort of distinction between sudden onset crisis, earth earthquakes, volcanoes, tsunamis, then that's a slightly different category. But as Simon pointed out, I think for DFID, it's about 80% of our money goes to, of our humanitarian spend goes to chronic crises, so Sudan, Sudan, Somalia, etc. We're really thinking about how can we make what we are doing in those contexts better. Obviously, you can have a lot of discussion about better, but from, uh, for us, it's also 
you have a humanitarian need, but a humanitarian response is not necessarily the best thing to do. It may be better to look with the development actors, which is why I like the question of what should we do as a collective, and it might not, it might end up being a much bigger mix of actors, including development and humanitarian actors, bringing together their skills on the table rather than starting, as uh, Dan has pointed out, from an assumption that this is our tool, this is what we do, this is the solution. We're asking what, what do people need, how are they hoping to move forward, and how can we support them rather than having a predefined um, response. <coughs> It's very much an opportunity for us on how to bring together the humanitarian and development communities. So, as I said, I'm development um, have a development background. So we're help hoping to pull some of that chronic humanitarian response a bit more into the development sphere, so that we do have more options in how to respond, so that we can have more flexibility, so that we can tackle some of the underlying chronic issues, which in a country like Sudan, even the best humanitarian response in the world is in a one month or one year period is not going to solve the underlying chronic issues. We really need to have a new way of tackling some of those issues. Thank you, Duncan. Now, 